Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What an awesome presence of God that's already here in the house. Lord Jesus. Scripture here during the um, uh, during the message, but I don't have one right to begin off. First of all, I want to give honor to my pastor and to Sister Dory. I love you guys so much, and I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for the leadership of this church. Um, we are blessed, you guys. We are blessed with um, a pastor who loves the Word, who loves God who is not afraid to step on our toes a little bit because at the end of the day, when he's facing God, it's going to be, what did you do for your congregation? Who did you lead to Christ? And he's gonna answer for us. And I'm so thankful that he is not afraid to take a step on our toes when it needs to happen. And I appreciate you, Pastor, and I'm thankful for you. And I'm thankful for Sister Dory. You are the epitome of what it means to be an apostolic woman. And I am thankful for you, and I'm thankful for the example that you give to us and to this church. And um, I, I admire you, and I'm thankful for you. Um, I am, uh, tonight this message has been mulling over on my heart for a while. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm an emotional person. Um, I know, shocking. Shocking! <laughs> <laughs> I'm an emotional person, and it's been, it's been a, a, a battle, if you would say, for a while of, God, why would you make us with emotions? Emotions are so strong. They can draw you to make good decisions. They can draw you to make bad decisions. They can make you cry and at a whim. They can make you scream at a whim. Like, God, why, why did you create us with emotions? They are so hard to control and so hard to deal with. And um, this message tonight is what God has been dealing with me when I, when I asked him that question. And I genuinely asked him that question in prayer. I was like, God, why? Because this is ridiculous. <laughs> and this would come off of it. So tonight I'm going to speak about the emotional Christian. And I want to preface this by saying um, the whole subject of emotions and living for God is, could literally be a series. It has been a series. We've We've visited um, emotions that destroy as, as a church. Um, Pastor has, has done an amazing series on 10 uh, weights, sins, and struggles. If you missed any of that, I encourage you to go to our Facebook, to our YouTube, to, I think those are the only ones. Oh, we have an app. Go to our app um, and, and review those and look at those um, because there's a lot to deal with when it comes to trying to strive to be Christ-like. That's what it is to be a Christian, is to strive to be Christ-like. And dealing with that and also dealing with our humanity. And as a reminder, Jesus was 100% God and was 100% man. And so as Jesus, when he robed himself in flesh, he experienced so many of the things that we experience right now. And as an emotional person, or as an emotional Christian, or as a Christian in general, I think it's become this, almost this stigma that emotions are bad, that too, feeling too deeply is bad, that feeling too much is bad. And it's kind of just become like, emotions has almost become like a derogatory term. It's like, oh no, I gotta stay away from that. I'm a Christian. I have to be even keel at all times. I have to be emotionless when, when out and about. I have to do this, I have to do that. When I believe it's the exact opposite because God has shown us so many times in the Bible where he himself has emotions. Jesus showed emotions. Jesus showed love. He showed joy. He showed compassion. He showed anger. He showed sadness and grief. He showed all of these things. And not only did he show them, but he also showed us how to experience them. And so I've been feeling lately to do a deep dive 
into the emotions that drive us. And, and if we're supposed to be living a victorious Christian life, then what does that look like while also dealing with our humanity? And why are our emotions so strong? Why are they so strong, God? Why can our entire bodies be affected by sadness and grief and joy and hate and anger and love? When you're in love, you get these butterflies in your stomach and you might get some warm cheeks. When you're angry, your face, I don't know about you, but my face and my ears get real hot <laughs> when I am angry. It affects my body. When I'm sad, it feels like there's a weight on my chest. It feels like my body is being drawn to the ground. And sometimes I just want to be on the ground when I'm, when I'm sad or when I'm feeling uh, deep, motion, deep, deep emotions of sadness. Um, emotions are powerful enough that just a small session or a small hiccup in your day can affect your entire day. I was listening to a podcast recently. Um, that's because of my husband. He loves, he loves podcasts. And so I'm getting into podcasts. I was listening to one recently and this man was talking about how he was talking to a friend at church and he was telling him about his day and he was like, man, it was a terrible day and this and this and this. And his friend stopped him and he said, was it a terrible day or was it a terrible five minutes? And that made me step back and think. And I was like, how many times, how many days have I had where it was a five minute or a 10 minute or a 20 minute situation that completely derailed my entire day. And then I come home and I'm like, I, everything else was fine. Everything else worked the way it was supposed to, but it was that small session. And then I come home and I'm like, man, it was an awful day. It was a terrible day. And I put day in there when really in reality, it was a terrible five minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it was, or maybe a multiple succession of, of those, those times, but it affects, it affects our, 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 affects our entire day. Our emotions are how we perceive our world. The way you feel about something is how you will see the things around you. It's how you will say, well, that's good. That's bad. That's right. That's wrong. It's how you feel about a certain situation will, will be how you do it. It's also how we connect with other people. Um, happiness is how sometimes how we connect with other people. Joy. You're happy about something. I'm joyful about something. Let's be joyful together. You're sad about something. I'm sad about something. Let's be sad together. You have a passion about this. I also have passion about this. Let's be passionate together. It's how we connect with other people. And when it comes to emotions, we are still made in God's image when it comes to emotions. In uh, Genesis 1 27, um, uh, the word that is the word image um, is Salem, and I hope that I'm pronouncing that correctly. It is spelled T Z E L E M for all of you note takers. It is uh, pronounced Salem. And that word in there, Genesis 1 27, when it says, uh, Let us make a in, in, in our image. It actually, the root part of that goes all the way down to dark or shadow, meaning that we are not only made, we are made in Jesus's likeness. We are made in his image, but we are also made in his shadow. So what does a shadow do? Do I have a shadow? Oh, a little bit of one. I have a shadow. It goes with me when I go this way. It goes with me when I go this way. When I take a step back, when I raise my hand, when I go over here, my shadow does the same thing that I do. So if we are made in God's image and we are to shadow the things that he does, we are to shadow the things that Jesus did. We are to shadow how he received emotions and how he gave emotions. The only difference is that God is God and he is perfect and he had emotions and he, he, uh, put out those emotions, but he's perfect and he has complete control. So therein lies the work that we have to do working on how, and I sometimes don't like using the word control because it's just such a, I feel like the only control is God. God has control, but we learn how to use those emotions and use those in our, in our walk with God. And instead of um, feeling ashamed that we have emotions or feeling ashamed that we feel in a certain way or feel ashamed that we felt a certain way for a while can take it to God and use it for what he created it for. And one of the things that I believe that um, emotions has become, you say a hot button issue in 
Christianity or in, in faith is because the world has distorted and perverted what emotions mean and what, those, what emotions look like. The devil has made a career of distorting what God has created. Do you realize that the devil can't create anything? He, can't, he doesn't have the power to create. The power of creation lies only in God. So the devil is a trickster. So what he can do is pervert and change and twist what God has created. The devil didn't even create his own home. Hell was created by God. The people, the angels that followed him were created by God. He himself was created by God. So he is limited to the power that God gave him. So he can't create anything. I feel like we give the devil too much um, power at times. We give him too much credit. We are, we're surrounded by Hollywood where Hollywood puts good and evil on the same playing field. And it's, it's a battle to the end. And you don't know who's going to win, even though good usually ends up winning because that's how it has to be. But it's like a nitty gritty battle to the end. But that's not how the spiritual realm works. God has already won the battle. God is already triumphant. And so the devil is doing everything he can do, knowing he's already lost to take as many people with him as he can. So he's got these, these tricks, these things that he does in order to twist what we know as emotions into, into other things. Because our emotions, every emotion that we feel is God-given. Love is God-given. Anger is God-given. Even a reverent fear is God-given. But it's been twisted by the devil to mean different things. Um, the devil in himself has tried to twist his image so that it seems more like he has more power. Um, in Peter, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He is compared to a lion who is roaming around seeking to devour something. But then Jesus in Revelations 5, 5 is described as the lion of Judah. So the devil tries to twist his own perception to make himself seem more powerful, to make himself seem like he's got more power than what he actually has. And he can imitate a lion, but he doesn't have the bite. He doesn't have the power. He doesn't have the royalty. He doesn't have the deity. He doesn't have any of that, of the true attributes that are possessed by a kingly and a royal lion. And the only one that possesses those things is Jesus Christ, as described as being the lion of, Ju of Judah. The devil can roar all he wants to. He can get in your face all he wants to. But he cannot create things in your life. He can only distort what you allow him to distort in your life. The devil has tried to make a kingdom. If you read through Ephesians 6.12, it says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness. He's tried to create his own kingdom but he can't create anything that matches the power and the kingdom of God. And like I said before, even the devil's kingdom, hell was created by God. He made it as a punishment for the devil and for all those that followed him. And unfortunately for those in the world that decide to not follow after God, but even, even his realm was created by God. God feels love. He feels hate. He feels sorrow, jealousy, compassion, anger. You can find all of this in the Bible. And when God came to earth and robed himself as flesh, as Jesus Christ, those emotions were then seen in the physical. Jesus wept famously, the scripture, John uh, eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept, two words. <laughs> it's just two words, but there is so much weight to that scripture. Because someone who knows the end from the beginning, someone who is perfect and sinless, why does he have need to cry? Why does he have need to weep? Why does he have need to have emotion? Because he loves. He loves us and he wants us to love in the way that he loves. He flipped tangle tables in anger. He ate with sinners and then he died on the cross for you and for me. The love that God originally intended has been turned and perverted in, into lust. It's been turned and perverted into an immoral love between, between partners of the same sex. It's been perverted 
that love is love and you have to accept love for what it was. That's what the world and what the devil has perverted into love. But love's basis was for the relationship between us and God. If you look at Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Jesus said unto them, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. I think love gets attacked so hard because it literally says these two commandments, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So if the devil can pervert love, then he totally takes out the base for the law by which we follow when we, when we follow God. If he can attack love, if he can pervert it, if he can change it, then he takes out the foundation on which we build our faith. He takes out the foundation on which we build our witness, our testimony. All of that is based on our love for God and our love that we should have for the people that are around us. If he can take that and he can pervert that, then he can take out our foundation from underneath us. Righteous anger is God-given. It's been turned into an immoral hatred. It's been turned into rage. It's been turned into um, so many of these things that, it's, that it was not originally for. In Ephesians 4.26, God commands, be angry, but then sin not. God wants us to get angry. He wants us to get angry with our circumstances. He wants us to get angry with the circumstances around us. He wants us to hate sin so much that we become a warrior for him and we reach out to people that are around us because we want to draw them out of what they're in. He wants us to get angry and not get comfortable with just having the love of God for ourselves. That is a righteous anger. And you could go deeper into that. And if you want to go deeper into that, Pastor did an amazing, I think it was... Two, anger. I think it was the second one of 10 weights and sins. Uh, uh, you can go on that. And he goes in depth into anger. But there are many times where God executed his justice in righteous anger. But the world has perverted it so that we don't get angry when things aren't right. We don't get angry when things are wrong. We pacify ourselves and we take a step back because I don't want to offend somebody. I don't want to hurt their feelings. When in reality, if everything that you do is in love, then the people that are supposed to receive it will receive it in the way that it's supposed to be. If we're not going to get angry with where we're at, we're going to remain uncomfortable. We're going to remain comfortable and sitting and keeping everything for ourselves. We're gonna remain comfortable in the same level that we've always been. We're gonna stay comfortable in um, the level that we're at instead of pushing and going deeper and moving farther where, where God wants to take us if we don't get angry about our circumstances. Reverent fear, a reverence for God, a respect for God, a respect of his deity, a respect of his kingliness has been perverted into being afraid of the unknown, of being th thrown into these like paranormal activity and horror movies and gore and all this stuff. Like that's what fear is to us now. And we get afraid so easily because it's so easy for I, what I don't know, what I see as different, what I see as, as wrong is immediately going to cause me to have a spirit of fear. The first record of fear in the Bible was when Adam and Eve took a bite of the fruit, of the forbidden fruit. That was the first record of fear because they looked upon themselves and realized they were naked and were like, oh no, I've got to cover up and I've, I've got to cover myself. Before that, the only fear that Adam and Eve, the only fear that Adam and Eve had was a respect and a reverence for God. They walked with him, they talked with him, they had a relationship with him. And when sin entered, entered the world, that's when fear was twisted and is one of the greatest tools that the devil uses against us. One of the greatest tools that he uses to keep you from doing things for God, one of the greatest tools that he uses to keep you thinking that you are unworthy, that you are untrustworthy, that what you have, nobody wants, that even if you did give somebody a testimony, they would laugh in your face. And could that happen? It could. But that could just be one time, or that could be two times, that could be three times. But the next time that you go and talk to somebody, 
That could be the person that you're supposed to talk to and bring them to the house of God. We can't let fear overtake us, and we can't let fear keep us from what God wants us to do. In Proverbs 15, 33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And in Luke 12, 4, or Luke 12, 5, but I will forewarn you whom you should fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. There, Jesus is saying, you shouldn't be fearing anything of this world or any person of this world. The only one that you should be fearing is God. The only one that you should have respect for, the only one that you should have reverence for is God. And when fear was perverted, it was then that God had to instruct us in 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. It is the spirit of fear. God did not give the spirit of fear, but he did instill us to have a respect and a fear for him. But it was the devil that took that and perverted it. Sadness and sorrow were felt by God, but the devil has turned that and perverted that into an all-consuming depression that leads to isolation. It leads to loneliness. It leads to turning to worldly things in order to seek happiness, in order to get some type of happiness, in order to get some kind of relief from this sadness that we are feeling. It causes us to look for ungodly things because in in that moment when you're just feeling all consuming depression, it's just like just anything that I can get to get away from this, I don't wanna feel like this anymore. And it's all consuming depression that leads so many times to people taking their lives. Because if the devil can get you to think that you are worthless, that you have nothing to offer, that you have no purpose, if he can pervert that and get you to take your own life, then he's won at that point over you. But if you look at 2 Corinthians uh, 7.10, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There is no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. There is a sorrow, there is a sadness. Like like I said before, the famous scripture, John uh, 11, 35, Jesus wept. He took time for sadness. He took time for grief. And God knows that we are human and he wants you to take that time, but he doesn't want you to live there. He doesn't want you to be overrun by the sadness and overrun by the pain and overrun by the hurt. Because when we get comfortable in our sadness, that's when we we think that we're okay. That's when we think that we can get the most sympathy from those that are around us because that's what's become comfortable to us. But if we look at the sorrow and look at the pain that through this sorrow and pain, I am reminded that this world is not my home, that one day I will be with Jesus. And when I get to heaven, nothing can harm me. There will be no sickness, there will be no disease, there will be no pain, there will be no heartbreak. None of those things will be in heaven. And it is through sorrow and it is through pain that I see that I need a savior, that I need a healer, that I need a miracle worker. And God's ways are higher than our ways because there are some times where I see that people have to live with a pain, but that those people that are living with perpetual pain know that God is their joy. They know that God is their light. They know that God is their strength. And they are some of the most joyful people that I have ever met in my life. Because it's not about what my body is going through right now, but it's about what's going to happen when God calls me home. 
Like I said, it's okay to take time to feel sorrow and take time to feel pain and take time to feel hurt. Because in those times, God's going to reveal himself in ways that he couldn't reveal to you in other situations. He can't reveal himself as a healer if you're not in pain. He can't reveal himself as a provider if you're not lacking in finances. He can't reveal himself as a comforter if you are completely comfortable in where you're at. He can come alongside you. He can lift you up. But like I said, God does not want us to live there. He wants us to learn, to grow, and to keep moving. Jesus wept. Then what did he do? He wept over the death of Lazarus, and then he went and he rose Lazarus from the dead. He did not wallow in that pain and in that sorrow, but he took steps out. And as I said before, Jesus has felt it all. He has felt every bit of it. I mean, how many of us in here had multitudes of people turn against you, scream for your death, and then were crucified on the cross? Anybody in here? No? <laughs> I mean, I don't say that to belittle what any of us are going through because it's not to belittle what any of us are going through, but to say that, to say that Jesus has endured it all. He went through pain. He went through sorrow. He went through all of these things. He knows what you are feeling. He knows how you feel. But it's when we keep it inside to ourselves that when that's when the emotions can truly take us over and take us to places that we never thought that we would go. Sadness, like I said, can take us to depression, take us to dark places. Anger can take us to bitterness. Hatred can take us to bitterness. Seeking happiness can take us to bitterness. The Bible doesn't or God does not guarantee happiness. He guarantees joy and peace. It's that it's all about me culture as to where I want to find what makes me happy. I want to find what makes me feel good. I want to find what makes me feel like me because I want to find me. And God's in there saying, you need to find me. <laughs> you need to walk after me. You need to seek me. And when you seek me, all the things that you are trying to make yourself into will be completely different. All the things that you thought were important are no longer important. All the things that you thought would be life-changing or life-ending or life-starting. None of those things matter. Because God is not concerned with our happiness. He's concerned with our souls. He's concerned with making sure that we are on the right path. And when we are on the right path and we are taking his righteousness and being clothed in his righteousness, then will come peace. Peace in our circumstances, peace in our emotions. The devil has taken all of this. He's perverted it. He's twisted it. And like I had said before, we tend to put them on these even playing fields where it's light against dark, where it's good versus evil. But there's a reminder that darkness is not actually the opposite of light. Darkness is the absence of light. So our emotions with the absence of the light of God will take us to places that we don't need to be in. But our emotions fully surrounded by God's peace, fully surrounded by knowledge in God, knowledge of his word, knowledge of his presence, a relationship with him. If we can learn to use our emotions and not live by our emotions, then we can have a much deeper and a much more divine connection to God. He doesn't want us to live emotionless. He doesn't want us to live and let it just continually roll off your back because if it's continually rolling off your back, it's rolling into a jar that's just getting bottled up and eventually could explode. But there's so many times that God wants to use that emotion to show things that are around you, but also sometimes to show some things that you need to see on the inside of you. If he brings you to a place of sadness, then you might see a pridefulness that you didn't know that you had before. If he brings you to a to a lower place, you might see some things 
that are in your spirit that you didn't have a chance to see before. He will take you through trials and he will take you through tribulations, but God promises that he will be there with you every step of the way. Even if you don't feel him, he is there. Even if you can't see him working, he is working. Even when you come to church and you're raising your hands and you're saying, God, I just, I don't feel anything. I, when will this pass? When will this trial pass? God is saying, I am here with you. I am walking with you. Every step you are taking is ordained. Every step that you are taking is being made in a perfect plan that I have. And if you will just continue to follow me, yes, you're going to see pain. Yes, you're going to see sorrow. Yes, you're going to take, you're going to be taken through some things. They're going to test your emotions. But in the end, it's going to be for your good. In the end, it's going to be for your better. It's also going to show people around you who you are. It's going to show people around you who God is. And what do we do with our emotions when they feel too great? Philippians 4, 6 through 7, basically saying, bring them to God. When my emotions feel too great, bring them to God. When there's too much neg negativity going on, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, cast it down. We have the power. Psalm 103, 8. God is merciful and he is gracious. He is slow to anger and abounding in mercy. If we are a shadow of God, then we can use that. Be merciful, be gracious, and not just merciful and gracious to people around you, but be merciful, merciful and gracious to yourself. We're human. We're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to make bad decisions, and God knows that. But be merciful, be gracious, be slow to anger, and be abounding in mercy. And like I said, um, emotions and all of that could be made into series after series after series after series. And it is our part as Christians to recognize how to work through them, how to use them, and to live in it, but not live by it. If we could all close our eyes right now, and if we could stand. Lord Jesus, I thank you for creating me in your image. I thank you for creating me in your likeness, Lord God. I thank you for looking down the years and seeing me, seeing me come into this world and you knew what I would face. You knew what I would go through. You knew the pain that I would endure, the sorrow. You knew every emotion that I would face and you came before me, God, and you felt it. You went through it. You did all of those things for me, God, for me, Lord Jesus. I ask God for your protection. I ask God for your guidance. I ask God for your clarity and knowing how to deal with every single emotion that I go through. God, help me to know how to use it and to not be overrun by it, God. Help me to know how to use it to affect those that are around me. Help me to know how to use it to turn my world upside down, Lord Jesus. This is all for you, God. Everything I go through is all for you, God. And I thank you for every trial. I thank you for everything that I go through, God, because I know that it is perfecting me. I know that it is changing me. I know that it is creating in me. I know that it is moving me. It is sculpting me. And I thank you for it in your mighty name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name.